thank you very much for the kind introduction and um, the invitation. We are very glad to be here and to present our pilot project, Eternal Prisoners, Compensation for Convicts During the Nazi Period and Its Individual and Social Consequences. And uh, uh, we want to start um, with a quotation by the Norwegian Knight and Fock prisoner, Alf Palo Andresen, who was imprisoned in Wolfenbüttel from uh, September 42 to April 45. Um, in a letter to his friend and translator of his work, Jochen Pöland, in 2003, he writes, Thus you see that we are still being treated as convicts and according to German jurists will be forever and ever. We are and will remain criminals, a point of view which is mildly put shocking. In another letter from March 2003, he adds to his statement, I am uh, I'm still completely shocked in view of this strange affair which turns Anne Vesby and me into internal, into eternal prisoners. Um, with this statement, Andresen clearly expresses his feeling of not being recognized by German authorities as a persecutee of the Nazi regime and therefore of not having a claim to compensation. We incorporated his statement into our project title, as you can see, since it touches the core of our research project. The study of compensation payments uh, for those convicted of crimes Anti national socialism and their effects or the significance for those um, affected and their relatives has been um, so far an, uh, been a neglected research topic. Our project addresses this research gap and examines the individual experiences regarding the processes for recognition and compensation. The project focuses on convicts from Western Europe who were imprisoned and ec or executed in the Wolfenbüttel um, prison and who resisted the Nazi regime. It thoroughly examines compensation payments from reparations and legal regulations on compensation of the respective countries, as well as the corresponding bilateral agreements. Um, among others, the project addresses the following questions. What special regulations existed for those convicted by the, by the judicial judiciary, and there was a distinction made between um, victim groups, for example, political persecute, persecutees and resistance fighters. What role did the enforcement of compensation claims on an individual and global level play in the social recognition um, of the marginalized groups of victims? And can conclusions be drawn about the assessment of political resistance? And to answer these questions, our approach incorporates two research perspectives. We take into consideration both individual experiences of former prisoners and their family members, as well as the legal framework. And um, uh, David and I, we are a team of, um, of five working on this project for two years. Um, before we will take a more detailed look into our project, we want to give you a short introduction of uh, the history of the Wolfenbüttel prison and the Wolfenbüttel prison memorial. Okay, good morning. So a short introduction to uh, the penal prison in Wolfenbüttel. You can also see some photos. Um, from 1918 to 1945, the Wolfenbüttel prison was the central detention facility of the state of Braunschweig. As an institution of the UD Carey, it was embedded in the persecution policy of the National Socialists and played a decisive role in the assertion of power and the elimination of political opposition. Until 1942, for example, more people in the German Reich were imprisoned in the UD detention centers than in concentration camps. More than 15,000 prisoners were recorded between 1933 and the day of the and the day the penitentiary was liberated in April 1945. Well, before the beginning of the Second World War, the prisoners were almost exclusive, exclusively from the German Reich. The number of foreign prisoners increased sharply from 1939 onwards. 
They accounted for more than half of the of all new arrivals between 1939 and 1945. Wolfenbüttel prison became an important um, place of detention for so-called night and fog prisoners, as we heard in the beginning, um, who had been deported to Germany from the Western occupied territories as part of the resistance. The prison conditions worsened drastically with the start of the war, the expansion of forced labor, the strained supply situation and severe overcrowding led to more than 500 deaths among the prisoners. In 1937, the Reich Ministry of Justice also moved the, the central execution site for northern Germany from Hannover to Wolfenbüttel. By, 19, by 1945, a total of 527 people had been executed in Wolfenbüttel prison, almost half of them from other European countries. So now some short words to the prison memorial now. Um, the prison in Wolfenbüttel um, continues to exist to this day. In 1984, the former execution site, we saw it in the slide before, um, on the grounds of the prison was to be demolished. Um, the commitment of victims, associations and citizens, as well as the city of Wolfenbüttel, ensured that the building was preserved and the memorial was established, which opened in April 1990. Um, in 2019, a new document, documentation center has allowed visitors free access to a permanent exhibition. Um, so now let us look into more detail into our research project. Um, so obviously the history of the Wolfenbüttel prison shapes the design of our research project. We focus on Western European um, resistance fighters, so mainly Belgian, Norwegian and Dutch persecutees. The focus reflects the high number of foreign prisoners. We chose a comparative approach to gain insights into the different ways compensation claims were handled. Moreover, the history of the memorial shapes the project. The particularity of the project is the support of the descendants and families of the persecutees. This allows us exclusive access to private estates um, of victims that have been entrusted to the memorial as donations. In addition, existing contacts with relatives of victims and survivors associations are being intensified or established and interviews will be conducted. Of course, we will also evaluate archival holdings in domestic and foreign archives. Um, another particularity. Oh, too quick. Another particularity of this project, Eternal Prison, is that we are conducting the research together with the Institute for Braunschweig Regional History and with the Belgian Hogeschule Beavis in Kortrijk, and the support of the Wolfenbüttel Academy for Cultural Ex um, Education and the Lower Saxony Ar State Archives Wolfenbüttel Department. Part of the project will be source-based workshops with students from Braunschweig and Belgium. So now we want to look briefly at the legal framework of compensations, of compensation payments that we deal with in our project. So as we have already um, discussed yesterday, so shortly after the end of the Second World, oh, no part. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. We wrote it together, so. <laughs> um... Yeah, um, as we all have already discussed yesterday, um, after uh, the end of the Second World War, compensation claims um, or claims by non-Germans were assigned to a different regulatory framework. While German persecutees could claim compensation from the Federal Republic of Germany, um, the FGR considered compensation payments to for, uh, foreign persecutees as reparations and postponed their settlement until the conclusion of a peace treaty, according to the London Debt Agreement. The refusal by Germany to pay compensation to groups of foreign persecutees meant primarily that the affected states themselves had to pay support um, and payment um, to the persecutees who were often in a poor condition. However, however especially the Benelux states strongly um, disagreed. They argued that a distinction had to be made between reparations for war damage and reparations for um, Nazi injustice. Under pressure from the states, the Federal Republic of Germany therefore entered into negotiations, which after lengthy discussions finally resulted in so-called global abkommen. And these, among other things, um, payment 
in varying amounts for victims of national socialist persecution were agreed upon. The distribution of the money was regulated by the individual states themselves and the conditions varied. In the following, we would like to take a more detailed look into three countries and some case studies we have been working on so far. Um, so the first example is um, the Netherlands. In 1947, the Netherlands passed the Extraordinary Pension Act, and this law provided pensions for the descendants of members of the resistance who died or became disabled as a result of their participation in the resistance. The amount of the pension depended on the degree of disability. The claim to compensation was irrespective of nationality, unlike in Belgium. Dutch people who were part of the resistance outside the Netherlands could also apply. The um, Stichting 1940-1945, a private foundation, which also had campaigned for um, the creation of the law, implemented it. Other war victims um, did not receive special payments and were treated under the General Assistance Act. In the late 1950s, bilateral negotiations between the FG, FRG and the Netherlands on compensation payments started. Uh, the Netherlands assumed 25,000 beneficiaries, 6,000 Jews who had returned from concentration camps, 14,000 Jews who went into hiding or were sterilized, uh, 1,250 persecutees um, for, for their faith, and 1,220 persecutees on the basis of their worldview. Um, and 3,500 persecuted on the basis of their political convictions. Lengthy negotiations began. The main point of contention was the dispute over what constituted typical national socialist persecution. Finally, both uh, states agreed on the payment of 200 million uh, D-Mark, of which 125 million were reparations for victims. While the Netherlands succeeded in getting the amount they demanded, um, uh, Germany could preserve its position that members of the resistance, forced laborers and carriers um, of the so-called Judenstern were not being taken into account. And uh, currently I'm working on finding out what this legislation meant for Dutch prisoners of the Wolfenbüttel prison. Personal statements of families <laughs> indicate that there were difficulties to get compensation because their conviction was not seen as unlawful. Um, in one case, um, the persecutee even got less pension because of his time spent in Germany. Yeah, so now we come to the next case study. Yes, let's have a look at uh, the situation in Belgium. It's a bit different than in the Netherlands. So Belgium um, also created, like in the Netherlands, um, its own compensation regulations for victims of national socialism before the um, glo um, Global Abkommen came into being. In the uh, Statut de Prisonniers Politiques et de leur ailleurs, um, on February 1947, Belgium defined nationality as a criterion um, for compensation payments, um, as well as patriotic activity or political or ideological motives for arrest. In general, um, so in general, in Belgium, there was a broad definition of um, resistance, to, resistance to the Nazis. Um, and it was broader than um, just military resistance. Um, which included many different groups that were active during the occupation, including um, sabotage, clandestine press, help for hidden people, or um, patriotic solidarity in actions against the enemy. Um, Belgium was um, not the first state to enter into bilateral ne negotiations with the FRG, um, which made Belgium's nego negotiation position more difficult. Um, above all, the group of people to be compensated consisted mostly of resistant fighters. This posed a problem in the ne negotiations. Accordingly, in the first negotiations, Belgium presented a list of um, 129,077 people um, that had to be taken into account, uh, consisting of concentration, camp prisoners, resistance fighters, holders of the so-called Junchen and deceased persons, um, and also non-citizens on Belgian territory. So the FRT, however, subtracted from this list many, many different groups and came to a total of 30,000 persons to be compensated. 
and ultimately um, res repre representatives of both of um, states agreed on the payment of 80 million D mark. Um, however, even Germany reduced this list. Um, Belgium was free to distribute um, the money um, at its own discretion. Um, the use of the lump sum compensation in Belgium was determined in an arete royal from November um, 1961. The criteria for distribution was based on the aforementioned statute de prisonniers. Um, and only Belgian citizens um, received compensation. Racially persecuted persons continued to be excluded. Um, and three groups of victims were distinguished, um, survivors of imprisoners, those who died in prison, and those who died after imprisonment, but before the conclusion of the treaty with Bonn. And in the case of death, any claims were then transferred to relatives. Um, now I want to introduce a case study we are working on uh, right now. Um, you can see André Charon on the right um, in, of the picture. Um, he was imprisoned in Wolfenbüttel and who, after the war, um, was a co-founder of the Belgian Survivors Association of Wolfenbüttel Political Prison. And he campaigned for um, survivors from Wolfenbüttel, but also from all over Belgium, um, and for their compensation as a medical expert. Um, right here, we can see some files from his private estate. Um, uh, um, so especially on the right, the uh, invalidity pension, and on the left, the compensation for imprison imprisonment from 1948. So it's before the global upcome. The compensation for imprisonment says that he will get 1,500 francs per month of imprisonment. Um, so that's quite similar to the German Haftentschädigung. Maybe we'll hear about this later. And um, the invalidity pension file says on the right, that um, André Charon was interned in Wolfenbüttel and repatriated on May 4th, 1945. As a result of his arrest, he contracted the following infirmities, post concussion syndrome and loss of vision in the right eye. Um, finally, so, um, he got um, proof of 65 invalidity and a pension. Um, as a last case study, I will say something to Norway. Oh, how much time do I have left? It's just... Okay. Um, so we want to take a brief look into compensation of persecutions from Norway, a topic on which our colleague Dr. Johan Kostodis is currently working on. But first, Norway accepted the terms of the Paris Reparation Treaty of January 1946, under which Norway had received payments. The parliament passed the National Compensation Act for political prisoners in 1947, which not only awarded compensation for imprisonment, but also for so-called loss of wealth due to imprisonment. In addition, there was a generous widow and invalid's pension. The introduction of the Federal Compensation Act caused resistance among the prisoners' associations, also from Wolfenbüttel. Um, they wanted to sue for compensation from the FIG, but without success. The Erstattningsrat, the Compensation Council in Norway, was founded in 1955, when it became known that the Federal Compensation Act would be passed. However, claims of Norwegian persecutors were rejected. The Statnitzrat henceforth aimed to at changing the federal German legislation. On 7th of August 1959, the treaty between the Federal Republic of Germany and the Kingdom of Norway on benefits for Norwegian victims of National Socialist persecution was signed in Oslo. We can see it on the right. It granted the payment of 60 million um, dollar uh, D-Mark to the Norwegian state by 1961. The assumption was that 45 people were ended, entitled to compensation. This was based on calculation criteria of the federal German compensation. Already in March 1960, the Norwegian parliament passed a distribution law in which no distinction was made according to the reason for imprisonment, but only the category of political political prisoners was named. The decisive factor for receiving compensation was the length of imprisonment. Moreover, there were supplements for invalidity, and there were also lump sums for surviving dependents. By the end of 1962, 25,000 Norwegian citizens had been compensated. Um, so what we want to find out uh, now is if the Norwegian prisoners in Wolfenbüttel belong to these 25,000 compensated Norwegians. According to our research, we assumed that there were 18 Norwegian prisoners in Wolfenbüttel. Most of them were crew members of the so-called Kvarstad ships, which tried to get from Sweden to Great Britain. 
um, and then they were deported to Germany as night and fog prisoners. There, without notifying their relatives, they were sentenced by German courts and executed or imprisoned. The Nazi regime hoped to break Western European resistance through, resistance through this deterrent. Um, on one of these prisoners was Helge Strey Johansen, who filed a lawsuit against the company Vogtländer and Co. for a great, uh, I quote, 10 months of slave labor. We can see the document on the right side. Um, and also um, Helge Strey Johansen and eight other Norwegians claimed for um, BEG um, compensation, but all, as we know now, but all applications were rejected. Um, so we asked if he um, got compensated by Global Abkom and want to find out this. Or did he remain like his compatriot Andresen stand, stated from the beginning as an eternal prisoner? Uh, with our project, we want to address this question. Now we look forward to your commentaries, suggestions, and questions. Thank you.